John Scritter Haddish hadn't been to this part of Hollaberry Town since he was a young'un. He had heard there was some commotion down at the town square where old Wallace and his boys had been taking folk for an unwanted drag behind their horses just for giggles. <laughs> Most people survived this little game, but none survived unscathed. It was time for some retribution in the shape and guise of John Haddish. Some would say John was past it. A drunk, a recluse, a man that only the old remember and is no good to the young. I would say that John Haddish was the most talented Mandarin writer I had ever seen. He came back after taking a few years off from slaying wrongdoers to practice his Chinese. Spritter was about all he needed to get that done. Reading and writing was his gold, and by God did he achieve it. Old Wallace got what was coming to him. A Spritter subscription and 10% off. Haddish had made sure he took the seven-day free trial. Wallace loved it never pulled anyone behind his horses again and to this day he lives in taiwan horse and strap free reading and riding at a great level john scritter haddish struck again and disappeared into the mist like the heat rising off the scorched sand of sandy bay don't forget to click on the link it would mean the world to us and uh, and the people of hollaberry now y'all enjoy the Gwambor. Mandarin Monkey 广播时间 Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Mandarin Monkey podcast. Today, we have a special guest. Mr. Ryan Lee is here with us, serial entrepreneur,、mm. a serial language learner. We'll get into that in just a moment. I don't know whether you're bi, bilingual, trilingual, quadlingual. I don't even know if that's the real word.、Um, mm-hmm. But you're certainly a very interesting uh, uh, gentleman. How are you, Mr. Lee? Li Zhengjie. Hey guys,、uh, <laughs> thanks for having me on. <laughs> <laughs> Absolute pleasure. So,、uh, the first thing I wanted to chat about、uh, was、uh, the story of how Mandarin Monkey and Ryan met.、Oh, and I, good, Ryan, good. do you remember this? Do you remember what happened?、Uh, I remember a bit. I mean, I, I was listening to you guys、uh, to your podcast、mm. for a little bit, and then I remember that you were. Talking about making a trip to England or、yeah. the UK or something,、mm. and I was wondering how you were going to bring your computer stuff and whatnot. And I had a spare flight case here, so I offered it to you. I'm not sure if that was the first time that、it、was. We... That was it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Super yeah. appreciated, by the way. 对啊，谢谢你 Yeah. So yeah, no worries. Ryan got in contact with us、uh, via Facebook and, and just said,、uh, you know, I listen to your podcast and.、Mm. Uh, I heard you guys are、uh, uh, perhaps taking a trip to the UK, as you just said. Yeah, it's because of visa relationship. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and said I've got this spare、uh, case. You could probably take some of your stuff in it. You fan- if you fancy it, you know, come and grab it, whatever.、Mm. But and also, but also mentioned that language garden existed. Ah,、uh, 对 And then you said you invited us. You said you want to come and do a live session up in the language garden. 对 Yeah, I remember that. So how how is language garden now? Obviously, COVID. Kind of killed that idea. <laughs> coming to do a live version、mm. for a number of months. Very bad time. Yeah. 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 But we have been talking about it for a while. Coming up and and doing a, a live podcast with you guys.、Mm. And and now we're probably we're possibly coming up with Grace Gore. If you know who she is. I'm not sure who that is. No. Okay. So、mm. Grace is a like a big YouTuber、uh, here in Taiwan.、Uh, she's based、okay. in Taipei, but we just recently. Got her on the podcast a few episodes back, but mm-hmm, mm-hmm. we sort of made an、uh, an agreement with her. I said, "Hey, I might talk to Ryan actually about coming up and doing a lot live podcast and bring her down as well." So, you know, it'd be like a trio、oh. at Language Garden. I think that'd be kind of、yeah, cool. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, very cool. So, what what is Language Garden? Could you could you fill everybody in on on what Language Garden is? Sure. Yeah.、Um, well, Language Garden has kind of evolved over time, as you said, like. Uh, partly due to COVID,、um, we started like having in-person meetups in in Taipei、um, back in December of last year,、mm-hmm. mm. and then I guess we were meeting every week, pretty much、uh, every Tuesday and Thursday evening.、Um, we would get together anywhere from 
20 to 50 or so people would gather and practice multiple languages. We had uh, English and Mandarin, of course. Uh, we also had Japanese, uh, German, French, Korean, various languages, but it really depended who would show up, um, which would determine which kind of language tables we would have. Um, and then after that, uh, we, we continued until maybe mid or late March mm -hmm. and then COVID became more serious. And then we decided just to take the meetups online. Um, we, we have a line group, but of course that wasn't really a good format for us to, to practice languages. So I set up a discord server and in discord, if you're not familiar with discord, it's kind of similar to Slack in some ways, mm -hmm. but maybe a little bit more fun. Right. And it's got like the organizational features. Um, you got your channels on the left. We were able to organize, um, like we've set up 20 different language channels. Um, and we have like both text and voice, uh, channels. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we, we've continued our meetups there every, every Tuesday and Thursday, um, from eight to 10 PM. Um, sometimes people are late, they show up at eight 30, but sometimes they stay on until even midnight or I've seen people chatting in there at like 3 AM, you know? Mm -hmm. wow. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty cool open, uh, open platform. Um, people can come and go and chat. And I think we just hit 1,400 members now. Right. Um, and since, fun. yeah, and since it's not, um, just a lo like a local meetup in Taipei anymore, we have people joining us from all parts of the world. Now we have people from Japan, Singapore, Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, but it's more convenient for people closer to our time zones, of course. So, mm. Mm. so way similar language garden. Why, why did you start it in the first place? Mm. Um, yeah, that's a good question, I guess. Um, I'm a language lover myself. Um, I've had an interest in particularly Asian languages since I was very young, actually, like, I guess around 15, 16, 17 years old. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. I just started seeing like Japanese writing, uh, Chinese writing, things like that. And I was like, it was so fascinating to me. And, uh, one day I met a guy in the U S he's, he's half Persian, half Hispanic. Okay. And, uh, he's, he's American, but his, his dad was from Iran and his mom was from Mexico mm -hmm. and he had spent a year in Shanghai and he came back speaking Mandarin, like, I don't know, pretty, almost, I would say almost fluently. Um, and then he also picked up Shanghainese and he was uh, studying Japanese. Indian. Indian. Just one year. Yeah. Just one year. Wow. Uh, and he was studying Japanese at a university. Right. And, uh, and a friend of mine had a Japanese anime store in the U S and he, he was Vietnamese. And, uh, anyways, so I was just surrounded by like a bunch of different, like, like Asian culture, mm -hmm. Asian languages. And he came into his store one day reading some of the posters on the wall. And mm -hmm. I was like, you can read that. <laughs> and I was, I, I guess I was 17 yeah. at that time. And he was like, yeah, yeah. And he told me about his story, you know, how he spent time in Shanghai and he was learning Japanese and, and this and that. And I was just so impressed. He, uh, he gave me a book and like in the book, it was, it was a Japanese book, but on the, in the front it had hiragana and in the back it had katakana. And that's just two of the writing systems. If, if you're not familiar with oh, yeah. uh, Japanese mm -hmm. and, um, so he gave me that and I just started like every day trying to learn how to read hiragana, katakana. And then after that, um, I was like, this is so great. I want to continue. Um, I bought a book called kanji power. Okay. Um, so kanji is like, you know, the Chinese, Chinese characters. Uh, and then that book had like 300, 300 characters in it. And uh, so basically I, I learned how to read and write hiragana, katakana, and about 300 characters when I was like 17, 18 years mm -hmm. old. And then when I was 19, I ended up moving to Japan. Wow, cool. um, yeah. So I was like, I wasn't sure that I was going to move there. I just wanted to go there for a bit to give myself a chance to, um, practice the language, um, see what I could do. And I ended up loving it so much. You know, I just, I basically stayed in Asia for, I guess, 16 years now. Right. Um, yeah, but I've moved around a bunch. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so back, to, back to your question. I mean, I'm just a language lover. Um, I've done language meetups in the Philippines and Singapore. Mm. 
Uh, and when I moved to Taiwan a little over a year ago, I decided just to continue kind of what we had in Singapore. Um, and that's kind of how Language Garden was born. Nice. Many languages. Yes, and we all your friend uh, that you said that came, uh, went, moved to, did you say Beijing or Shanghai? Shanghai. 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 For a year. You said, mm -hmm. what yeah. was he, do you know what, did, I, I'm assuming as a language lover, you grilled the hell out of him to find out how did he learn a language uh. to near fluency <laughs> in one year. So, um, yeah. what, 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 what kind of things do you, do you remember him doing or him talking about he, he was doing uh, anything special that comes to mind? You know, that was a long time ago, actually. So that was, I don't know, 20 years ago. Um, but I would say probably just partly due to him being, I guess, 18, 19 years old, probably at the time, um, being immersed in the, in the environment where everybody's speaking Mandarin and Shanghainese, uh, probably was a big help for him. And I, and I guess he probably made a lot of friends there and, and tried really hard, obviously. Um, sometimes it's, it's easier to say than do, you know, sometimes you, like I, I, I knew a bunch of Japanese people who had gone to the U S to study in university and they end up just hanging out with each other. Yeah. They don't really end up speaking English and then they go home after four years and they're like, well, Didn't like I don't that. really speak English, but, yeah. <laughs> but I guess, um, if you find a way to take full advantage of the situation, then it, it could really be beneficial to you even just one year. Yeah, I yeah, I think that's a trick, isn't it? I, I found that even if you're like, if you're in Taipei, for example, if you live in Taipei, mm. there's a lot of Waigora in there. I yeah. mean, you live in Taipei, yeah. right, Ryan? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yes. uh, there's a lot of Waigora in there. So there's a lot of English hanging around, especially, you know, if you get involved in those circles. Mm. Uh, I thought we're lucky. I, I was a slightly luckier because I, not luckier, but... I don't know what the word is. We, we live in Taiwan. Yeah. We live in, yeah. Well, no, no fortunate is the wrong word because it's not, I don't know, it depends on you. But we live in Taichung and there's not a lot of foreigners here. Mm. Um, so there's not huge circles of, of, there's not, sorry, there's not as many as in Taipei, right? So there's not huge circles sure. of foreigners that I can find and, mm. you know, speak a lot of English with. We have to socialize with local people, which is what helps the language, right? You need mm. to be immersed, like you said, perhaps your friend was. Yeah, yeah. That's the next the next target. Oh. Like, what the Mubi is maybe learn uh, uh, Tai Yu, but um, <laughs> we'll start a new YouTube channel for that one, I think. <laughs> Teach Tom Taiwanese. Sure. Um, <laughs> okay, cool. So a, a language lover, and actually language lover, L-O-V-R, is was one of your virtual learning environments, no? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, that was, um, I've been into VR for, for a while now, I guess at least uh, three to four years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started building like a virtual uh, environment where I was hoping that maybe either language garden or language lover, as you said, L-O-V-R um, could be a place for people to go into and still like meet each other online and practice whatever, their, whatever language they want to 24 mm seven, -hmm. you know, anytime that they're available, just go in. Mm. Um, unfortunately right now, um, I mean, you don't have to have like a VR headset, but you do need to have a computer that's semi-powerful enough to process the graphics. So it's, it's not that easy for just anyone to join at the moment. Uh -huh. Um, but maybe as like web XR, technology improves and people can just use their browser, it'll, uh, be better. But yeah, so we've been working on a little bit of like a, like a virtual language learning environment. How cool. So you, I mean, I've seen a lot of that and I was, I've, mm. al I've also seen you, you know, building these interesting sort of conferencing. I've actually attended one uh, briefly. I, te I attended one, uh, business one. It was a business, yeah, like a yeah, showcasing your business type uh, conference where there was some strange looking characters in there, right? We're so small. Yeah, it was one tiny little woman creature thing. We are also. I don't know what we were. We are very small. Everyone is so big. Yeah, huge. Yeah, huge people. Yeah, huge people. We couldn't really hear it uh, because I think it was too far away from the stage or something. Mm. Or there wasn't anyway. But it looked really interesting. I think the concept is really interesting, especially during COVID. I think there's a big market for that. The only issue is VR equipment is expensive. 
<laughs> right? Sure. Um, it's it's becoming cheaper, but yeah, sure. I mean the the quality is pretty good now, but the hardware still does need to become a little bit cheaper. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess the that Facebook recently announced the Quest Two, yeah, and I think it's starting around maybe four hundred bucks or something U.S. Yeah, um, so I guess it is getting cheaper. Um, but still needs to go down a little bit further, I guess, for more people mm. to get it. I think yeah. so. I think they they possibly need to separate gamers, uh, you know, gamers from people who just want to use it in the social sense. Um, yeah, yeah. Perhaps there's mm-hmm. perhaps there's some technological difference between you know the the functions of the two, uh, that could keep the cost down. I don't know, mm. but I mean, it's it's a very interesting idea to have a virtual environment where you could go and learn and this mm, kind of stuff. Yeah. Especially because we're now working from home. Yeah, I feel like it's real. Yeah. Oh, that's the thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> One day, Ryan, are you working on that touch? How are you going to conquer touch in VR? Yeah, um, they already have um, haptics. Mm-hmm. Um, like I have full body tracking um, gear at my at my studio here, um, and there are some devices that you could attach to your body that would allow when you it, you apply a certain um, thing to it maybe if somebody remotely touches it then it would like vibrate or something like that so that's that that gets into something else that's a whole nother market right there yeah Yeah. but that will sell that that will sell a lot of equipment i guarantee you Um, (laughs) but you get you get people who yeah i mean yeah um so what what's your background in the sense of like mm. wh- why I mean you started language garden that's cool obviously you're a language mm. lover so that's totally understandable starting a business but why I mean why VR you liked VR for the last four to five years what involvement do you have in it do you do you code do you are you a BMR are you a developer or what do you, you know, what's your involvement in the business mm, yeah sure um, well my background yeah I. I I am a bit of a developer designer. Um, I do a lot of different things. Actually, I also do photography, video, um, various things, but in regards to VR, I don't really code VR. Um, I, I guess I've done a little bit more of like, uh, on the design side. Um, but I am involved in an open source project called Vercadia mm-hmm. and, um, there are very talented, um, 3d modelers and programmers from all around the world that are contributing to this project. Right. And this is the platform that we are using to host like the virtual language garden, for example, and a lot of like the virtual conferences that you saw. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's, that's one project that I'm involved in. Um, but I'm not, I'm not really coding for it. Um, but I am able to create worlds and, and whatnot as, being kind of like a designer, I guess, so to speak. So what do you use to design? Um, um, well, depends what f- for what format. Um, I guess if you're talking about for like uh, virtual worlds, a lot of people are using a very popular open source tool called Blender. Yeah, I use it too. Um, mm-hmm. Yep. Um, but of course, if if we're talking about, I also do uh, websites, web apps, mobile apps, um, all, all kinds of different things. So it could be either, either Photoshop, Illustrator, Sketch. Um, yeah, just what, depends. What languages is our uh, virtual environments coded in? Um, it could be a, a number of different things. Um, our, like Vercadia in particular uses a lot of C++ mm-hmm. um, for the engine um, and then there's some scripting languages being used as well. Um, there's like shaders and, and things like that. So you can have added functionality, uh, there, but I, there's other platforms and they all kind of do their own, their own thing. Mm. You said at the beginning of the podcast, um, that your strongest language as in one. is Japanese, right? Mm. Yeah. That's correct. Obviously, because you lived there for a long time and you had a passion for the language. <laughs> so yeah. what what kind of things would you do? I'm just going to change the subject slightly, still on language. Sure. But, um, when you lived in Japan, what kind of things would you do, and even to this day, to practice the language and to, you know, what, what's helped your language acquisition thus far the most, would you say? Right. Well, I, I spent, I guess, about four and a half years off and on in Japan. Mm-hmm. So that's probably the longest I've lived in any one country aside from the U S. Um, I guess 
partly um, studying the language on my own before I went there helped, of course. Um, and then being uh, a little bit uh, like a younger age when I started Japanese, I guess, also helped a bit. Um, but like the first three months that I was in Japan, I remember I didn't really talk to anybody. I was like, I was just absorbing like what was going on and what everybody was saying around me. Just, I would just go home, watch TV every day and just watch like TV shows, uh, like dramas and, and stuff like that. And it was like, I think the thing that helped me, um, at least improve my listening, um, quite a bit in the beginning. And then after about three months, I, I built up some courage to go out and start trying to use the language. Like, you know, so I could, I could kind of read, you know, I could read like hiragana, katakana, and a, like a small amount of like kanji characters mm. or Chinese characters. But, um, I didn't really know grammar because I, I didn't study any, anything in school. You know, I just self-taught mm. everything. Oh. Um, and so like, it was, it was kind of odd for me to go out and try to use the language because I didn't really know the grammar structure or anything. So I, I started at that time, like after moving to Japan and after about three months, I started like, I was like, okay, well, I better learn the grammar. But then after a while, I realized if I just start repeating the same things that other people are saying, then maybe I don't have to worry about grammar so much. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I, how I went with Japanese in particular was I would listen to what other people would say and I would repeat exactly what they said, what a native speaker said, and then just use that. And then that would just became like, instead of vocabulary, it was just like a phrase. And it was like, okay, this is like stuck in my head. And like, I would just reuse it over and over again. Um, so I didn't have to worry about grammar because I knew that's what, that's how it was said, I guess. Grammar seems to always be like a. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a, mm -hmm. yeah. For a lot of people, unless you're like kind of like a bookworm kind of person <laughs> who, who really enjoys getting into the. You know the theory behind grammar and all this kind of stuff. Because not every language, every grammar, are adopted to every situation. Just every different situation, you have to use different grammar. Right. 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 We use different. 长辈，像如果是那种爸爸妈妈或者是老板，跟你对医生或者是朋友那种，他们的那个用的词就不一样。Yeah. 对，所以你要真的就是去 copy 他们说的话，就是比较有用的。Yeah,、嗯、I think、啊、if, if you if you studied and copied a doctor, your your conversations、嗯、would go slightly differently, right? <laughs> 当然，当然。<laughs> actually, actually, the, 不同的对象。The method that you talked about, Ryan, was、uh, a similar one I use myself.、Um, Learning like grammatical rules, like le, for example. I've explained this, said this before a bunch of times. Yeah. Totally, I, I totally didn't get, and I kind of still don't get、uh, why I use le in certain situations because there's various exceptions. The grammatic in the grammatical sense,、mm -hmm. I just know when、mm -hmm. to use it because、sure. I've listened to you、uh, to, to Eula and various other native speakers use it, and I did the, I did use the same method. I copied what they say and thought, okay, so they put a le there,、mm -hmm. and that's what that meant. So next time I say that, I'll do it that way. And then see what happens. And it was trial and error, right? Yeah. Trial by fire. But your, your, your method is you have a background knowledge, and then you use it. That method, Ryan, your method, you have a background knowledge, and then you use it. Or you just copy whatever they say. Yeah. 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 If you look at it like a baby,、uh, like from a baby standpoint, like they're not only learning the language, but they're also learning the world like around them.、Mm. But it, as semi adults or whatever, I guess we already have a lot of knowledge about certain things, so that helps us. We don't have to completely start from scratch.、Mm. Um, but yeah, I guess、uh, it could could be a combination of the both,、uh, both so of those things.、Um, And I guess also it it depends like on your background. So like, or your or your native language. So for example, like if you're coming from Korean, say for example, and you're learning Japanese,、um, it might be a, a little bit easier for you since their grammar structure is similar.、Mm, oh, um, right. Yeah.、Uh, whereas like coming from like an English speaker background,、um, 
Japanese grammar is like completely backwards. You know, it's、mm. it's maybe more difficult for people. Whereas Chinese grammar sometimes seems similar to English, but sometimes not. You know, <laughs> at least when you compare it to Japanese or Korean. Yeah, I've heard Chinese that about Japanese. Chinese and Korean, actually, are also quite different. Yeah, I, I've heard that. Oh yeah, completely different. Yeah, yeah. yeah.、Mm-hmm. Um, mm. What specifically? I mean, just talking methods. So, like Eula was, it, when you would listen to someone speak, would it would it just be a memory that you you'd go,、oh, I remember what he said. Okay, so rem- what do you say? Jiao,、uh, uh, you know, Jiao Wu Tom, Jiao Wu Tom, Jiao Wu Tom. Or or did you write it down when you were listening to people?、Uh, you know, what what method or on your phone or something? What method would you use to re- you know to remember these sentences if you? Yeah, I think when I first started with Japanese, I did write things down. Um, like the first two years before I moved to Japan, like I, I was just like going around、uh, like the local university in my town, and there were quite a few like Japanese、uh, international exchange students,、mm-hmm. um, and I would ask them, "How do you say this? How do you say that?" You know,、mm-hmm. and I would write it down. But later on,、um, I think it just starts to stick. Maybe、um, this is, and I guess it's kind of the same way with、um, like reading.、Um, Like you know, there's so many Chinese characters, right? And、uh, some are used more often than others. So, like, if I'm watching a movie or something like that,、um, and there's like a character that I don't recognize,、uh, you know, I may just let it go by. But after I've seen it three, four, five times, I'm like,、mm-hmm. okay, I need to know this character because I keep seeing it,、mm-hmm. and, it's and I'll、common. make an effort.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll I'll make an effort to go and and figure out what that one is, so that next time hopefully I will recognize that character. Ah,、yeah. oh, repetition. Yeah. So still to this day,、yeah. you, you kind yeah, of yeah. you you use this method. Yeah, I think so. Um, unfortunately, um, I I don't know. I guess recently I've been a little bit busy with work, so I haven't had as much time as I would like to spend with. Uh, language learning,、mm-hmm. um, and then I, I want to say like almost ten year. There was like a ten year period where I started my company, and I really didn't touch language as much at all、um, until maybe again like around four years ago. I started picking up、um, Mandarin again. Like I had, I had studied Mandarin off and on for like a year or two by myself、mm-hmm. um, many years ago, and then I just about four years ago when I moved. Uh, back to Singapore, I decided like, okay,、um, I want to try Mandarin again.、Um, so that's that's kind of when I when I started. So like, people ask me how long have you been learning? I'm not really sure. Like four, five, six years, but、mm-hmm. like not straight and not super seriously. On and off, yeah. But、um, but like about two years ago or so, like I was still in Singapore at the time, and I was visiting. Uh, Taiwan,、um, off and on. Like I would come here for two weeks or a month or something, and I noticed my Mandarin would improve very quickly. So I thought, wow, if I could just if I could just live here for a little bit, even you know, it would it would probably really help me. Just you know, immersing myself because in Singapore there are you know obviously there are a lot of Mandarin speakers, but some are better than others. Some, whenever they get into a difficult situation, they'll switch to English or but they speak or they'll throw、Singlish. in English vocabulary. Right, they speak. Is it Singlish there? They speak. Is it ta- Tamil、yeah. and? 很多不一样的。中文 and 英文 and yeah, like Malay. four different Malay. Right, okay, there you go. So like、mm-hmm. four different languages at one time. And they switch between、mm-hmm. them. Yeah, they sometimes have five languages. It's nuts. The same sentence eight times. Yeah, yeah, we. They can use five different languages. So it's amazing. Singapore's language level is so scary. They have to adapt to all their languages. It's very good. So what do you、yeah. think your level of Mandarin is like now? So what do you think your level of Mandarin is like now? Um, it depends if you're talking about speaking or reading. I would say my reading is probably advanced. My speaking may be intermediate or slightly higher.、Mm. Um, but I feel like my pronunciation is kind of not so great.、Right. Um, I, I think I still need some more time. Like J- Japanese is not that difficult to pronounce. Like it's it's pretty flat, monotone. It's、uh, you know consonant vowel consonant vowel. Um, so it's not as difficult, but with Mandarin, I didn't really pay any attention to the tones in the very beginning, and then、Ouch. regret it later on.、Mm. Uh, regretted it later on, but、um, yeah, it's, I, I hear the tones now, but I still, when I speak, I really need、uh, more time. I need to improve. So, do you so. on a day to day basis?、Uh, do you speak Mandarin? 
Uh, yeah, I would say so. I think um, even if I don't speak it daily, I definitely hear it daily. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So within your office mm-hmm. environment, I'm assuming yeah. there's a lot of Taiwanese people like you work with? Either. Um, well, I, yeah, I, so I was in a co-working space. Um, I still go there off and on. I'm not there every day, uh, maybe a couple of times a week. And yeah, there's a, a it's like a very international environment, actually. Um, there are some Taiwanese people there, but there's also a lot of foreigners there that have their own startups. Right. Um, so these days, I guess I hear Mandarin less than I used to because there are so many foreigners, foreigners there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely, you know, going, just walking down the street or going to order food or going to 7-Eleven or whatever. It's a very different experience here than like, say, for example, even Singapore or anywhere else, you know, they, they're going to speak Mandarin to you. So it's kind of, yeah. you need to move nice. to, to Kaohsiung or to Taichung. Yeah. <laughs> and then, cause you'll speak Chinese yeah. a lot more. Oh, okay. you, you'll hear it and speak it a lot more because there's no way Goren. Well, yeah. There's of course there's way Goren, but not just me. Yeah. The, yeah. 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 <laughs> Come on, pack your bags. Um, yeah, to Tainan, Tainan Oh yeah, it's very yeah. tasty. Tainan is my paradise, my heaven. Food's heaven. Because of the food. Yeah. Uh, really like yeah. Tainan. The Tainan's the history, their history, and their food are all the Taiwan's best. I'm just saying. Yeah, to me. Yeah. So, do you have what? Here's a quick question, actually, about about um, staying here in Taiwan. So you decided to move, did you say from Singapore to here or was it to Japan to, to here? Yes. Singapore. Yeah, I moved from, I was in Singapore for about three years this last time. And then right. I moved here a little over a year ago. So how are you here in the sense of, um, do, you, do you have like a startup visa or like a business visa or something? How, how are you staying here? Yeah, exactly. Um, so you could either call it a startup visa or, visa or an entrepreneur visa. Okay. Um, it's kind of like a special visa that the government, I don't know exactly when they came up with it, but they are allowing, um, foreign investors. F- yeah, exactly. To come here, set up your company and they, they kind of give you a little bit of support. And then there's, uh, a, a number of, um, agencies here like accelerators, incubators and whatnot that will also help or assist you with various things like sponsoring you to, uh, to get a visa or to help you get like an R and D subsidy, a grant or things like that, depending on what kind of business you're doing. Point us in the direction, uh, Ryan, what direction is that? <laughs> um, where do you get R and D money from? Um, there's different, um, departments within the government that, okay. uh, you can make proposals to. Mm-hmm. And, uh, if they like what you're working on, they could give you, I don't know, anywhere from 1 million to 5 million, or I don't, I'm not sure if that would be more than that, like NTD. Oh. What's the terms um, do you know for that? Yeah. Um, well, um, basically it's not, I, I guess it depends on the program. But um, it's not necessarily like a, an investment where they hold like shares or anything in your company. Um, but yeah, there's different there's different programs. There's there's different uh, criteria. So some could be like you must be you must have already had your company for one year, mm-hmm. um, and then you'd be eligible for up to uh, five million or something like that. And then, but depends on the project that you're working on and maybe you're putting in 5 million, they're putting in 5 million to help you succeed right. towards whatever goal you're working on. Um, if you were like a company, uh, not quite one year old yet, then maybe there's a smaller subsidy that you could apply for. Um, yeah, there's a lot of government assistance here. Um, I think Taiwan's a really great place right now for startups, mm-hmm. although it's still a little bit difficult when it comes to like international banking and yeah. moving money in and out of the country. Yeah, it's, that's, yeah. it's quite noticed. quite complicated. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems to be a little bit behind here in banking, if I'm honest. <laughs> uh, a number of years, I'd say. Different That's I, crazy. I'm not sure that they're behind, but I mean, they're definitely. I think they do it on purpose. I don't think that it's the technology side. I think that it's 
they purposely want it to be difficult because of reasons I'm not sure that we should go over on, okay. on air. <laughs> oh, yeah. all right. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Probably. Yeah. Possibly. Um, the, the fact, just, just the basic fact that if you start any job, I'm not sure if you've worked in Taiwan outside of your own businesses, but if you start uh, working in different companies, usually you require a different bank account for different yeah. businesses. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of backwards. It's just a, oh, I mean, that's it, weird. No, in, I didn't know. In the UK, obviously you would have, or in the States, you would have a bank account from some major mm-hmm. bank and yeah. you'd go to work mm-hmm. and they say, what's your account number? And they would pay you into that account number. But here you will get a job at, I don't know, you're teaching English, for example, you'll get a job at a school and they'll say, well, you need to, to join USAN or whatever it is, <laughs> uh, that mm-hmm. bank, because we only pay to that bank account. So you have to go and open a new bank account with that particular bank, yeah. very specifically. Oh, that sure. bank. So mm-hmm. you end up with 20 different banks <laughs> if you have no loads of different jobs. <laughs> it's just, sure. And then you have to organize who goes where and what's your main uh, account. And it's just, yeah. yeah. Like I'm 20, 20 years, Right. Yeah, see, that's the thing, right? Six banks. <laughs> that's nuts. It's nuts. It, that, in, well, in that way, it's, back, it's behind, you know? Yeah, well, I, I was, I'm okay. Like, you know, I have a business bank account and I have a personal bank account. And I thought it was interesting that only one bank in particular, which you just mentioned, they, yeah. they're the only one you could use uh, with PayPal. Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, we had to search um, for them to do yeah. that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then um, I like I mean that, you know, just, to, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, that's what I mean by behind. Uh, uh, yeah. most banks now in the West will link up to, you know, for online payments one way or the other, whether it's Stripe or PayPal yeah. or some other gateway, you're going to be able to take online payments. But Isan is like apparently the only one. I think they one. did it on purpose or something. I think that they've somehow found a way to take control of that. Right. Um, but yeah, like, like on my, on my phone, you know, I like that I can easily just open up my phone. Don't need to remember the login, yeah. use my fingerprint. Right. To unlock it, I can easily do a uh, foreign currency conversion. Yeah. Like I can convert from Taiwan dollar to US dollar, and then I can send it. So I, I feel like the technology is there. They just purposely put these restrictions on things so that it's not easy to, you know, you have to go through the investment commission a lot, like especially as a foreign entrepreneur. Mm. Like if you want to set up a company here and, and uh, bring capital over from overseas to set up your company that has to go through the investment commission. And that, that right. takes two to three weeks. Oh yeah. Um, and you can't really handle it by yourself. You have to have like either a lawyer or a CPA sign off on it. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things to work through. Uh, well, for that. We were, reg- we, we were, a, uh, we were a, a registered Taiwanese business. So we registered our business in this country, mm. not obviously in the UK or anywhere else, uh, through mm-hmm. obviously choice, but we've never really looked into, um, approaching the government for funding for oh, that kind of thing. But it's very interesting you yeah. mentioned that. Um, it, depending on their terms, I mean, I wouldn't like to go to a bank, if I'm honest, in this country and ask them for a loan, but... Um, I think you should prepare some more special documents, or special documents, or you should do Let's say TV program. specific skill. That's what I was wondering about. That's what I think my next question was going to be like, what kind of things are the government investing in? Like, what are they, do you know what they're concentrating on at all, Ryan? Like, what are they looking into? Is it specifically technology or education or what, what markets do you know are they interested in investing in, if you know what I mean? I think it is very complex. I think that there's um, multiple departments and they all have their own focuses. So I think there is like ministry of education. Mm. Um, There's, there's going to be different departments that have different uh, things that they would be willing to invest in, I suppose. Um, For us, um, we've mostly been looking at like, you know, blockchain and VR related stuff. Um, And they seemed interested um, but my company is actually not one year old yet in Taiwan. Right. So in December, it would be one year old. Um, so still been thinking about what I wanted to do with that. Um, so but yeah. I, I don't know, really, really my passion is with languages. So I would love it if there was some way I could do something with, um, Education. with language learning or something in, in even if it involves some part of VR or some part of blockchain or whatever it may be, but I, I really wish it would be something language related. So I, I, 
your, your, bank, your, your company's one years old in, in December. I give you $5 million. What are you going to do with it? <laughs> um, yeah. So basically like there's a form that you have to fill out and you, and it's very, it takes, it'll probably take you a couple of weeks to fill it out. Like you have to very specifically state what you're going to do with this money. You have to say like, they allow you to spend this percentage on uh, like contractors or outsourcing. They, mm-hmm. this amount can go towards this certain type of thing. Of course, yeah. Um, so yeah, you, you know, obviously if, if you're, if you're doing something that requires some sort of like hiring, then uh, maybe a good portion of that's going to go towards salaries. Mm-hmm. Um, if you need to buy equipment, then part of that can also go towards equipment. Mm. Uh, so yeah, it just, it depends, but yeah, you definitely have to tell them down to the last penny where everything is going. Of course. Yeah. 就很像一个企划书嘛, mm-hmm. 一个proposal document, mm-hmm. 就是你要告诉他们你的公司的理念, uh, business, uh, Business targets, yeah, uh, 或者是像公司, it's a proposal, isn't it? Yeah, it's a business proposal, yeah. But mm-hmm. Ryan, if I was to give you five million dollars, how what would you do with the five million dollars with Language Garden and with uh, Language Lover, L O V R? What would you do with the money? Develop uh, in your businesses. Um, I would say like it. It depends if if I've. In my case, for example, like I've already got some of it built out, so maybe less of it would go towards manpower. Uh, probably more of it would go towards marketing. Okay. Um, that would probably make more sense. Like if you already have a product, um, then push it. Maybe less. You wouldn't need to. Yeah, you wouldn't need to hire more people necessarily. Um, it just depends. But yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't applying for subsidy for like Language Garden or Language Love or anything. That okay. might be a tougher sell. Uh, it was more on the, just on the VR platform side in general. Um, but yep. Okay. Mm-hmm. So nothing, you haven't got anything other than outside of marketing, you think you'd spend the money on, uh, to push those? Um, probably a little bit would still have to go into like, um, developing out some, some features and, and tools and things like that. But, um, uh, yeah, I guess everybody's case would be different. Um, in my, in my case for in, in particular, I, you know, I've been working on it for a little bit already, so we already have some of it built. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we've got some features like if you're talking about the virtual world, for example, like you can go into one of the virtual language rooms and you can pull out a virtual tablet. And while somebody's speaking, let's say somebody's speaking Russian everyone can pull out their virtual tablet and they can have their, their own native language on the virtual tablet. And it will do like a direct translation from Russian into whatever language. So they could all, there could be like 10 people and they all speak different languages, but everybody can kind of communicate somehow by looking at their virtual tablet. Mm. So and it it will translate real time for them and then print the tablets more. Yeah. Yeah. We'd probably work more on stuff like that to, to improve that. Um, We have like some translation bots Mm-hmm. So for example, like, um, just, just kind of like you could think of like a website chat bot, for example, right. but this one is attached to an avatar. So, and a voice, so you can actually talk to it and whenever you, it could understand any language, but right now we only have English for replying. So we were working on, right. uh, I believe it was Spanish and Mandarin. Yeah. I think we were working on Spanish and Mandarin and, mm-hmm. uh, this, this requires a lot of work. So that would probably be something that we would want to improve. Like I've seen people come in, they spend 30 minutes talking to one of these bots and mm-hmm. it's not perfect, but it's, it's entertaining because they try to take in the information that you say to them and they will use it like your name. And if you tell them where you're from and stuff like that, then it'll try to use it in a conversation. So it's kind of, are you taking, are these bots taking, is this AI? Are they, are they taking any data from these conversations and learning at all? Um, minimal. It's, it's like a temper. It's not like true machine learning. Mm. Um, I would say it's, it's more like, it's just like a temporary memory. Um, there's some open source, uh, like AI ML, um, bots out there that some of it's used for like chatbots and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I think it's, you know, what people typically refer to as like AI and whatnot. That's, we're still long, long away from anything like that. Right. Right. Yeah. So what's your, 
What would you say your, I mean, do you have a goal for language? I mean, we like the idea of language garden as a thing. I, also because it's a physical, it's a physical thing you can go to, mm. right? And sit down with yeah. people. It's not ideal in, in, in when you're just a, a bingdu, but mm. it's. Right, so, but I like the idea of it. And I definitely like the idea of coming up. And I remember you pushing that to us a number of times, a couple of times, uh, but unfortunately, obviously we got Bing-dum. held up. <laughs> but we still want to come and do it. Is that yeah. invitation still there? Mm. <laughs> uh, yeah, of course. I would always love to have you guys, but right now we aren't we aren't doing anything offline of at the moment. Mm. Um, we're still just doing it online, and I don't really know the future plans of right. the offline side of it. Um, we do have so many members who are joining us now, like remotely, like from other countries. So we would, you know, lose some of those people if we were to um, to do it in person. Which we, you know, we've been considering ideas like how could we bring them in like remotely to the uh to our real world um with a 360 camera or, for example right uh, on each yeah table. yeah or yeah or if or if it should be kept separately you know we've you know we've thrown around some different ideas but um haven't really decided on the future of the offline side of it just yet we've had like a few um cafes reach out to us as well and, and ask us to hold meetups there. But like I said, we just really haven't, haven't decided if we wanted to go back offline at, at this particular moment. Um, we were using uh, a pretty good space at, at the ground floor of our co-working mm-hmm. uh, space, but right now they've been doing some construction and whatnot, and we weren't able to um, resume meetups there, even if we wanted to, but, um, but yeah, that should probably change maybe in January. So you, you're unsure on the future of Language Garden as a as a as a as a business, or as an entity. Um, I would say just the offline part. Mm. I think the online part is fine. <clears throat> Sorry, okay. um, and I don't know if it's going to be like going more towards the virtual side, like virtual reality, or if it's just you know being on discord. Mm. Uh, I think it's important, like no matter what you're doing, whether it's a business or hobby or idea, like you should always keep in mind like new technology and just continue to improve and and move forward. Don't be so stuck in one particular way. I think that's, that's important. So like, I think recently, um, you know, moving to discord was a, a very big change like it was difficult for people um a lot of people weren't used to discord but now a lot of people have fallen in love with discord and they started joining other servers and stuff like that so it's it's um it's becoming a really popular tool it's not perfect um but it's it's probably one of the best that we've used so far and it's it's got some customization um i there was an article i i didn't can share it with you later but somebody said that it was something about how discord accidentally created the future of the internet. So it's mm-hmm. maybe an interesting read uh, we can look at later. Yeah. I could definitely send it over. How can people get to your discord server if they wanted to, how do they find it? Um, yeah, there's a special invite link. Um, I guess it's not that easy. Uh, the best way would either be to be to go to our website or our line group or our meetup.com page. And what's the uh, website? For Language Garden. And then there would be a, a link there that could bring you directly over. Um, let's see, we have language.garden. Mm-hmm. So that's like the website URL. So there's no, no need for www, no need for .com or anything. It's just language.garden. Oh. Oh. Okay. Um, and I think, I believe we also have languagegarden.tw. Okay. Um, but yeah, if you go to meetup.com and you search either language garden or you look at any of the local language meetups, we should be, we should pop up there as well. Awesome. I have one final question. <laughs> sure. So I'm coming to you and I am a, a young, hungry, upcoming language lover. <laughs> uh, what advice would you give me as a language learner and language lover yourself? Uh, what advice would you give to me to, to, to best set me up for my language journey for, for acquiring a sure. language? Sure. Um, I guess what I would say, um, try to find something that interests you, um, whether it be like music or movies or TV shows, dramas, um, try to, to get 
immersed into these things to help you stick with it. Forget about vocabulary drills, forget about grammar. Um, just kind of take in as much of the language as you can. Even if you don't understand it, just try to learn the sounds, try to um, maybe in the very beginning, maybe reading is a little bit difficult, but maybe start to expose yourself to a little bit of that if, if possible. But just, I think people often, they, they worry too much about um, learning all these words that they're never going to use or, mm. or worrying about grammar that they end up speaking in a weird way. I think just listen to what others are saying around you, repeat what they say. Um, I, you know, definitely care about your pronunciation. I mean, don't, don't not speak, but uh, I think in the beginning you, you want to develop a good habit. Um, otherwise it, in the future, it might be harder for you to, to change the, the, the way you pronounce things. Um, so yeah, just really, it's about staying interested in, in whatever you're learning. So, you know, it, forget about the grammar, forget about the vocabulary drills, just, just watch TV, watch movies, listen to music, do whatever you can, maybe translate, try to, try to take a song, simple song, try to t little by little translate the lyrics in, from either Mandarin to English or Japanese to English or whatever it might be. And just have fun with whatever you're doing. And as long as you're having fun, I think it'll be much easier to take in and remember. Yeah. Interest. I, I really agree. Yeah, I think some people start down the wrong tracks that way, right? Where they go, they dig too deep. Yeah,有些人就是拿着一本书，然后就说我要学中文。但是有些人他们就会觉得哦，我喜欢煮饭，我喜欢运动，我喜欢看电视，他们就会朝着这个方向去学中文，让你的心情会比较好啦。就是like
couple of different things. So like one, we thought it could be um, about life in Taiwan or as mm-hmm. an expat oh. or, you know, foreigners living in, you know, mm-hmm. other countries. Um, I've lived, mm-hmm. I myself, I've lived in seven countries. So I feel like um, I have a little bit of experience with that. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then also like, if nothing else, I feel like maybe, I don't know if we would use, we, we would primarily use English, but I would like to throw in Japanese and maybe some Mandarin in there as well. But I think it might be something that people learning English would also like to listen to. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe Japan, Korea, Taiwan. Um, so something, something along those lines, I guess. Cool. We, we thought the reverse of that. We, we thought Mandarin <laughs> Monkey would be a good, the podcast would be actually a good way in reverse yeah. to learn English yeah. for, for, right. for Taiwan, right? Uh-huh. But we, sure. we never market it that way. So it's not like we don't push it to those, to, but we uh-huh. should. Right? Maybe it's uh-huh. a thing. To think yeah, about. Yeah. yeah. We look forward to it. We're happy to come and guest on your podcast if you ever That'd do, be great. do get mm-hmm. it up and running. Uh, bang, bang. That's a digital thing. So we can do that. Yeah. <laughs> Joint recording. Them. Um, all right, cool. Well, uh, Ryan, thank you very much for, for coming on. We don't want to waste too much more of your time. Um, and chatting us chat, chat, for nearly nearly an hour now. Yeah, <laughs> no, no problem. Yeah, that Russian, that yeah, it's great. Um, anything else I can think of? Not really. Thank you very much, Ryan, for coming on. Uh, you can you can hang on if you, if you don't mind for a, a couple of minutes. Sure. Um, you can with me. 没有吗？好的，好棒！我喜欢今天的 podcast，今天的广播，听到呃，能够来自呃，在台湾住的外国人，跟跟我们分享很多关于business 谢谢李正杰谢谢Ryan you certainly can obviously we do group lessons free lessons and uh, private lessons you can get in contact with us on our website www.mandarinmonkey.com that's all you need don't forget to check out uh, Ryan's website everything will be in the link, link in the description below in both the podcast and on YouTube so uh, feel free to dig in and join the Discord server and all that kind of stuff. Bye. Bye bye.